bet the board. What do you mean you don't bet? I mean, I don't bet. You know, I don't bet. I don't bet. I never have. Well, yeah, right. I bet you 20 bucks I can get you gambling before the end of the day. You owe me 15 grand, pal. Pay him. Pay that man his money. It's the Bet the Board podcast. God likes me. He really, really likes me. In the end, I wound up right back where I started. I could still pick winners, and I could still make money for all kinds of people back home. And why mess up a good thing? Here's Pain Insider and Todd Furman. Welcome into the Bet the Board podcast, NFL Week 10, Monday Night Football Edition. Um, Action packed show on tap for you today. The good, the bad, the ugly. Little look ahead lines, injury updates, commanders and eagles. We've got it all right here for you. I'm your host, Todd Furman, joined as always by my steam colleague and co host, the one, the only Payne Insider. And Payne. Another week of NFL football almost complete. We're well past the midway point in the season. Hopefully uh, those energy levels are where they need to be to get us through the second half of the campaign accordingly. Yes, running on E a little bit this morning. So we're going to power through it, deliver a good show, talk about some of the things that we saw, break down Monday Night Football. You lead the way, sir. Lead us to the promised land. See, this is where I got to pump you up. I got to get you on the coffee kick that you fight nonstop against. Although I'm not a morning coffee guy, you're anti-energy drink. So it's all got to come naturally. You got an uphill battle every morning during football season. So I applaud the effort for the natural high. Good, the bad, and the ugly. Let's start off with a little bit of positive. Actually, you know what? Before we do that, Why don't we recap what we saw last night? And it was a game that you and I talked about last week on this very podcast about the Chargers under their current construction not being a very good football team. You shared a nugget with me before we kick this off about how bad the Chargers were over the final three quarters of that football game. You care to disclose that to all our loyal listeners who were, I'm sure a lot of folks are ready to cry foul if the Chargers didn't get there as an eight-point underdog? I think that's been the weird part about this season in general because at no point were the Chargers outside the number so when you're watching this game and maybe you're not completely understanding what's transpiring there it feels like it would be a bad beat if Elijah Mitchell didn't trip over the five yard line and and uh punch that thing in there and suddenly you're outside the number for the first time in that manner but you remove the script in the opening quarter the Chargers had the worst EPA per play the final three quarters of, of any offense in week 10. So it requires a lot of wonky stuff, right? The 49ers getting stopped multiple times inside the 15-yard line, settling for field goals. It takes a blocked punt by a guy who's feels like 12 feet away from the punter, <laughs> right? He's like, <laughs> like sticking his hand out there. Matrix-type moment out there for Chargers special teamers. <laughs> Yeah, and then it was like this Florida State dynamic duo where you get an interesting catch over the middle of the field for about 20 yards, and Asante Samuel Jr. slingshots the receiver down. He just perfectly lands on Derwin James Hellman. Here's a fumble. It was just one of those weird, bizarre games, and and ultimately we kind of hinted at that, right? The, the weird stuff that transpires sometimes in these public settings, and they all went the Chargers favorite uh, the in the Chargers favor and allowed them to to ultimately cover this game. Yeah, pretty wild. You mentioned the 49ers settling for three field goals, 26 yards or shorter in that game. They end up winning by six in a game where the first half goes over the total. Full game stays comfortably under, given some of that inefficiency that you just highlighted there from the Los Angeles Chargers. All right, into the good that we saw take place, and we may as well go with the game that was halfway around the world, first thing in the morning, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers' overall performance from an offensive standpoint, Payne. They actually ran the football and they did so effectively. Rashad White bursting onto the scene uh, alongside Leonard Fournette, 160-plus rushing yards for the worst rushing team in the league. More importantly, for the first time all season, they committed to the ground game. They took some of the burden off of Tom Brady's shoulder. And while I don't want to give Byron Leftwich a ton of credit because he did decide at one point when they had a chance to put the game away to throw to a 45-year-old quarterback running down the sidelines, and Tom Brady should have been re- awarded a yellow card for the trip he had on the sideline. The Bucks actually looked a little bit more buttoned up, and they carried some of that momentum from the game-winning drive against the much maligned Rams into their performance overseas. Yeah, this was 
you know, the more I dug into the game, the more I liked Tampa, but I couldn't get past the price enough to lay it. And we ended up on the total Friday afternoon. And I'll be honest, I was a little surprised the market gave us zero respect. And, and the price really matters, but sometimes even the market and betters within it don't know everything going on and, and make no bones about it. Like Seattle's a far better team than anyone expected. It's a great story. For me, Seattle's fractionally better than an average team right now. And I thought Tampa was getting healthy at the right time defensively, right? All three corners were up. Winfield Jr. and Hicks were back as well. And the one thing that kind of just kept poking my brain, Seattle's offense stepped up in class two times this season. And in those two games, Geno and the Seahawks combined for a negative offensive EPA per play. Tampa now healthy, right? It was in that similar class as those two defenses, and we outlined it and discussed it at length Thursday, and that was part of our breakdown. And sure enough, first three quarters all downs, Seattle had a negative 0.23 EPA per play. That was the worst mark of any offense this week. The game wasn't nearly as close as the scoreboard indicated either because you had that kill shot where Byron left, which for the first time, this season decided to be creative on first down and it's a throwback from a running back to a 45 year old 25 yards down the field wearing a knee brace and you're attacking Seattle's top cover corner it made little to no sense you mentioned the ground game getting going and you saw that transition a little bit to Rashad White just offers a little bit more punch in the ground game than Fournette and the one thing that we said about Seattle's resurgence defensively the last month was sure it's improved how much who had they played and there really wasn't many offenses within that four game sample where you said okay you know what this this defensive resurgence for Seattle is is absolutely real I believe it was two games against Arizona who is 30th in offensive efficiency it was a great spot against a Giants offense that was certainly overachieving and had some travel woes and some weather in the forecast they just some of the things they were doing didn't appear overly real and it's you see the market maybe not not be so far off as we initially anticipated on that game yeah uh, I mean like you said 21-16 final there a play here a play there Tampa can blow the doors off they gave Seattle a sliver of hope Uh, we're able to slam it shut and suddenly it's Tampa in firm control in the NFC South right now I want to give credit where credit is due to a team that I know you're fond of in the Kansas City Chiefs for what they were able to accomplish yesterday against the Jaguars it's not often that you find a way to cover in the National Football League as a nine and a half point favorite when you lose the turnover battle with a minus three ratio you're talking about a Chiefs offense that held the Jags to 5.2 yards per play they finished the game with a net plus 2.6 yard per play advantage flirted with 500 yards again and nine different Kansas City receivers caught passes from Patrick Mahomes we'll monitor the status of Juju Smith-Schuster good thing we have Deepak on to give us an update on what his expectations are for Juju's availability for Sunday Night Football against the Chargers but the Chiefs appear to be one of the more complete outfits and they were given a little bit of help Elsewhere in the AFC yesterday, they were able to take advantage. Yeah, it was a total team effort and through some adversity, right? I mean, you hit it perfectly. It's extremely rare that you can be minus three in turnover differential and still exceed odds maker expectation, especially the way this season's going with large favorites. And there were there were some issues along the way, not just Juju leaving early with a concussion, right? Right tackle Wiley. He left as well. And remember, Lucas Niang is who they want starting there. He's still a couple weeks away, so Mahomes effectively played with a third-string right tackle. All told, first three quarters, Chiefs nearly mirrored what the the Dolphins' offense did this week. Positive 0.4 EPA per play, 61% success rate. Defensively held Jacksonville to a 33% success rate on the ground, so they made the Jags one-dimensional. They forced Trevor Lawrence to beat them, and he looked good in spurts, getting it to Christian Kirk and that's an area where the Chiefs defense needs to be a little bit better because they are susceptible to the slot receiver and something we thought might give the Jags a little bit of a a fighting chance to put some points on the board there but this is a tough stretch for the Chiefs moving forward you mentioned catching a break there with the Bills going down but the Chiefs four of the next five on the road and ultimately this will be the stretch that I think determines where uh, the AFC kind of goes through in terms of home field advantage. 
You provided a nice little segue from the good, and I think it's worth highlighting. Much to the chagrin of us and our listeners, the Miami Dolphins offense didn't miss a beat, and I'm sure you have the metrics in front of you to further support that in terms of what we saw. I will give credit to Dolphins fans. They said it was the strongest crowd that they've had at Hard Rock Stadium since they renovated back in 2015. So, Payne, the Dolphins realizing that if you can go out there, you can score points, not punt the football. It puts, it puts asses in the seats. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. And and listen, it was the wrong side. I mean, it's very rare that, you know, you take four in a game and you watch it close like three a lot of places and it's just, it's not the right side. And you would have liked a little bit better of a game plan from Kevin Stefanski on the offensive side of the ball. You get the opening drive touchdown. Obviously, you march it into plus territory and Chubb has his first fumble of the season. And there was another instance where, you know, you have fourth and short at the 40 in the first half and, you know, you don't get any points out of that after turning it over on down. So there were some instances where the Browns could have kept it close early and changed the the dynamic of that game but ultimately it was the other side of the ball that was ill-prepared I mean the Dolphins never punted not once I mean Mike McDaniel just put on a freaking clinic and the Browns had two weeks to come up with that game plan for a familiar offense for Joe Woods and you just look whether it was through the air whether it was on the ground it, it just didn't matter Mike punched Cleveland in the mouth up front in the trenches anytime the Dolphins wanted to throw as well ball just didn't hit the ground I mean, Miami had the number one offense last week, right? 0.4 EPA per play, more than 62% of Miami snaps grade successful. No other offense eclipsed 55%. Defensively, the Browns' offensive line got completely overwhelmed in the easiest way to protect your secondary, not allow them to be exposed, right? Pressure Jacoby Brissett, which the Dolphins' defense did. 41% of his dropbacks, Brissett saw pressure. Miami's scary right now I didn't necessarily want to buy in and your hope is that they get a little bit healthier in the secondary I'm not quite sure what's going on with Byron Jones but that would be nice to get him back but Miami has not lost a game this season that two is finished it's pretty staggering and you mentioned Tua this note comes from NFL PR that was circulated on social media last night Tua becomes just the second player in NFL history with at least 275 passing yards three touchdown passes and a passer rating of 135 or higher in three consecutive games the only other player to accomplish that pain was Kurt Warner weeks three through five back in 1999 Tua finished with 382 yards three touchdowns a 139 rating in week eight recorded 302 passing yards and three touchdowns with a 135 rating in week nine he's not just putting up gaudy numbers by this year's standards some of the things he's accomplishing right now are absolutely historic and you mentioned it Mike McDaniel deserves a ton of credit the other crazy thing about it we talked about Raheem Mostert taking the baton from Chase Edmonds as the number one back that baton appears to have been passed yet again Jeff Wilson running perfectly in that offense given the level of familiarity he has with his head coach bursty to say the least. It feels like he has a little bit more juice, but it's a nice two-headed monster that knows that system well. And Raheem Mostert got involved in the mix a little bit there as well. Had some had some nice explosive runs. So I think that's going to be a, a, a perfect pairing for that run offense. And Mike McDaniel's got guys that fit that system perfectly. They show a little bit of speed. They're up the field, one-cut runners in that outside zone scheme. It's not always a beauty pageant to win games in the National Football League. And given what we saw in Pittsburgh, I'm not sure that's even strong enough. But the Steelers' relative domination against the New Orleans Saints, worried about the scheduling spot for New Orleans. Six days they return to battle after a very physical Monday night performance against the Ravens. And you look at some of the numbers here. They don't blow you away from an efficiency standpoint, but the Steelers, a 28-10 to 10 first down advantage. They run 79 plays on offense compared to just 45 for the Saints. From an accumulation of yardage standpoint, 379 to 186, a 4.8 to 4.1 yard per play edge. But most importantly for the Steelers, they just wore the Saints down. Nearly a 20-minute differential in terms of time of possession. And T.J. Watt gave the Steelers a little bit of an injection of life on the defensive side, even though Pittsburgh was playing without Minka Fitzpatrick, who underwent an emergency appendectomy on Saturday. This is one I regret not having more exposure to. I had Pitt and some teasers before they flipped favorite, and it was going to add some some Steelers straight, and then you mentioned, right, Minka Fitzpatrick was announced out randomly, and we weren't quite sure what Watt's snap share would be. You ended up playing more than I thought. But this was just your classic Steelers win, right? Off the bye, rested, just more physical 
and gritty, right? Just mentally and physically beat the crap out of New Orleans here. And if you look, the Steelers were a net positive 40% in rushing success rate. Held the Saints to a 7% rushing success rate on defense. Offensively, Najee Harris was called out during the bye. There were some speculations that he might lose snaps to Jalen Warren. Paid and off. Najee responded. And honestly, on game day, probably about 20 minutes before kickoff, I saw a group come in who bets a bunch of props and went contrarian and went over Najee Harris's rushing yards. It was like 43 and a half. So that was, that was an easy winner. But the Steelers... 47% of their runs graded successful. So you see that dichotomy of the Saints being successful in 7% of their rushes, the Steelers being successful in 47% of theirs. It just dictates and, and, and shows that there was just absolute trench domination there. The Saints defense being soft in the front seven is something we never saw coming. And then, you know, Pickett did enough to keep the Steelers offense balanced right now I mean obviously there's there's two teams yet to play but Pittsburgh ninth in EPA per drop back in week 10 so you had some nice balance there and Pickens got involved early with the nice touchdown and so let's see if this starts to trend up a little bit I mean one thing that we talked about was the Steelers schedule this season it was just brutal the most difficult schedule you know through nine weeks and so now all of a sudden you got a young quarterback got a young wide receiver just a young team in general hopefully the bye week did them some well and you're starting to get a little bit healthier in defense hopefully Minka returns quicker than what the in initial diagnosis is when you look at some of the other positives I have one team on my list that I want to get to but want to give you the opportunity to obviously highlight things since you pick up on a lot more than I do throughout the course of a full NFL day Boy, I think we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the Vikings-Bills game. And to me, just wild. And I said something on Thursday's podcast about the market being a really good indicator of what's going to transpire. And boy, there just wasn't a game that was more talked about for six days than Vikings-Bills, right? Just had this constant changing and conflicting information that sent the betting market in all different directions. I mean, even on game day, right? As reports are coming in, Josh Allen's not out for warmups, it, right? Market moves. Nope, there he is. Market moves again. <laughs> just just a, a wild NFL game. Of where's Waldo? Yeah, I mean, you look at the entire six game or six day sample of just like what the market was doing on this game. And it just was all over the map. And you know, you look at some of the performances within that game, right? I mean, this right now is being talked about as, as the game of the year to date. You just had two receivers going absolutely ham back and forth. I mean, Justin Jefferson, that catch is going to live on. I mean, to me, possibly better than, than OBJ's years ago when he was with the Giants. But... Justin Jefferson's just a freak, man. He can he can do a little bit more than than Diggs. And I know Diggs had a good game, but Justin Jefferson like can play above the rim, so to speak, right? Diggs is more of this elite route runner. If you look at Justin Jefferson yesterday, averaged three point seven yards per route run. Buffalo knew where Minnesota wanted to go with the ball. Cousins still threw it there anyway. I mean, fifty percent of the Vikings air yards. Diggs again, very nice work right underneath, catching seventy five percent of targets, but. To me, Monday morning, probably the time we finished the podcast, total was like 48 and a half. And I'll just, I'll just be honest, right? We, we bet that game pretty large and it sent a wave into the market and we got information that like it wasn't looking good for, for Josh Allen. And then all of a sudden, you know, by the time I would say like Friday rolls around Friday morning, you're looking at three and 42 and a half. And, you know, you're feeling pretty good. And then there's some like speculation that, you know, Josh Allen might start to play. And then all of a sudden the report Sunday morning is like, you know, he might start to play. And you got that back to six and a half and 46 and a half. And just just a wild game. I know you want to talk about this a little bit later because you're going to throw a certain gentleman into the, the bad or ugly category. I'm not no, sure. Which, no, 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 no. You're not getting out of this I now because I was getting out of it, but I hand. said there's some okay. things that I'm go I will bring up with him. There is no doubt about it, but I, I love how you go, yeah, we're just going to throw you under the bus, but that's fine. I'm going to own it because I put it on our sheet, so go ahead. 
No, I'm just we're 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 not letting you we're not letting you wiggle out of that. We're not, not letting gonna, you wiggle out of that. Not not wiggling out of it. But can I try and mend fences with a fan base that I've ripped to shreds <laughs> over the last couple of years? Because for the yes. first time all season, they it. gave their fans something to be excited about. I don't know who you're talking about, but go for it. It's the Green Bay Packers. For the first ah. time all season long, the offense put together a couple of drives when they needed them most, erasing a two-touchdown deficit against the Dallas Cowboys. Defense made plays. They get a big 31-28 win, a game where Green Bay did take money. They were a five-point underdog when we talked last Monday. They end up closing in that three-and-a-half range. They showed an ability at a few deep shots. Christian Watson, tantalizing potential there, four catches, 107 yards, and three touchdowns. May have had another big play if it didn't look like he had a dislocated pink when the ball made contact there but to Green Bay's credit they got the ball to their most explosive playmaker and it wasn't Watson it was establishing the ground game reminding all of us that Aaron Jones is the best player they have offensively on that roster they went out there and proved it uh, and by hook or by crook defense made enough plays they turn a 28-14 hole into a 31-28 win uh, at the expense of the Dallas Cowboys so I know you're the host but I'm going to help us transition into the bad because I could go a hundred directions with Cowboys Packers. Everything pointed to Dallas here. But the invisible man was on Green Bay. And anytime I don't know who's moving a game, it's always it's very scary. rare. Yeah, I, I just stay off. I sent more notes about who took Green Bay from five to three and a half than any game this season, and I just was not getting responses back and for the first three quarters green bay was doing bubkis i mean the cowboys held aaron Rodgers and company to a 40 percent success rate that was the seventh best mark this week through three quarters packers run game only had a 34 percent success rate through three quarters dallas comes in right with the number one defense in the league they were well rested off the buy they were playing you know we'll call it for a higher cost right mike mccarthy and despite dak throwing two interceptions to a third string safety in Rudy Ford who nobody had heard about coming in part of the shenanigans that unfolded right the Cowboys build this 14 point lead for its defense heading into the fourth quarter and in the final stands in overtime Green Bay had a positive 0.64 EPA per play so anytime the Packers snapped it in the fourth quarter in overtime that play on average generated 0.64 points Green Bay was creating some balance late for sure but to me the Cowboys defense absolutely no showed when trying to close this game out. I mean, it just it makes no sense to me that Dallas has the number one defense in schedule adjusted efficiency, well rested. They're going against an offense that had no life for the last month. And I'm all about being contrarian and finding edges beneath the surface. But nobody saw that fourth quarter coming, I don't think. And then you start to like process it in your head here, Todd, about like when you're down 14, how do you have to attack? Well, you're probably in known passing situations. And what has your offensive line been doing this year? Been giving up a lot of pressure in under two and a half seconds. It's why Aaron Rodgers has treated the ball like a hot potato. And now you have one of the best pass rushes in the league coming at you. It just it didn't matter. Didn't make sense. Didn't make sense this game. It's always funny when we talk about sharp money and you watch games unfold and you go, okay, you can see exactly why they were betting team A over team B. You can see the game flow. You can see plays develop. I'm not sure if you pulled any sharp better that was behind that move from five to three and a half. They go, you know, what's a perfect scenario for us. We're going to have Green Bay down two touchdowns in the fourth quarter. And for the first time all season, Aaron Rodgers is going to pull a rabbit out of his hat. If Green Bay was up 28 to 14 and had a hold on for dear life. Okay, I get it. I understand it. But just the way all of that unfolded, and it's kind of the running joke. You go, okay, sharp money's there. I can grab 14 and a half on the live line, a ridiculous price on the money line. <laughs> that couldn't have been further from my thought process when that game had a two touchdown deficit for the home team. Yeah, I thought it was done, right? Again, just like kind of going back to what I intimated there. It's like one team hasn't been able to push the ball downfield or protect its quarterback, and that's why he's been hot potatoing the ball for nine weeks. And the other team is number one in pressure rate, and it just didn't matter. Did not matter. All right, you did a great job of getting us into the bad. I had one illustration, and I feel, you know, you can only beat a dead horse so often, but this may be the final time I put them in the bad because I think it's now an established baseline. Uh, for that particular horse logo out there in the Rocky Mountains with the Denver Broncos. Two weeks to prepare. 
against a beaten down defense and Denver was abysmal yet again. The ground game went absolutely nowhere. 25 carries for 65 yards as a team. You get 16 for 48 from your running backs. And the second half drive summary pain reads like this. Three plays, five yards punt. Six plays, 32 yards punt. Nine plays, 14 yards punt. I don't know how you take nine plays and go 14 yards, but that's neither here nor there. Five plays, one yard punt. Three plays, four yard punt. And then the coup de grace, they actually still had a chance to force overtime or potentially you think go for two, knowing that their offense couldn't do much. 10 plays, 50 yards, ends in a game ceiling interception. Now I know Russell Wilson lost two offensive linemen in the game, was beaten and battered, but somewhere along the way, rubber has to meet the road. I guess fortunately for Denver, they play another dysfunctional franchise this week in the Las Vegas Raiders, where maybe it should be loser leaves town. Whoever head coach comes up on the wrong side of this one, pack his bags and uh, get his resume ready for his next professional opportunity. So from time to time, when we do Monday morning, right, I'll write down my good, bad and ugly. And a lot of it will will mesh, right? Because I mean, we, we see the results and this one I actually had in the ugly category. Okay. <laughs> and when I look at this game and you think about all of the elements in play here, this might be the most disappointing effort of the week. I mean, Denver plus three is very sharp, like very, very sharp, like sharpest of the sharp closes two. you pray for that to happen. Anytime you take three in the NFL is a better. Denver comes out, builds a double-digit lead, okay? The fear you would have in this game, based upon matchups, based upon some of the metrics, is Derrick Henry running wild against a Broncos defense that's, you know, middle of the pack, and they're down a couple defensive linemen. That's the fear. It didn't happen. Derrick Henry, 53 yards on 19 carries. The Titans had a 27% rushing success rate for the day. It was the second worst of any team this week. Well, you're thinking, oh, Ryan Tannehill must have been 100% healthy and just came out chucking it all over the park. Of the games that have finished this week, Ryan Tannehill has the worst completion percentage over expectation of any quarterback. 16% below expectation. The Titans are 22 out of 26 teams in EPA per play on offense this week. You just left scratching your head. Like, how, how did they blow a double-digit lead with everything that I just mentioned? And, you know. It's a combination of Russell Wilson being absolutely horrific, Nathaniel Hackett being outmatched at halftime with adjustments, and just the horseshoe continuing to be lodged up the Titans' ass. There is no explanation for anything like this. Nothing. I'm not sure how to even power rate or quantify anything Titans related. It is the most baffling thing that uh, I've seen over, I don't know, the last couple of seasons. Don't get me wrong. I mean, betting against New England used to be a pastime of mine when Tom Brady was at the helm. I knew what I was getting myself into, that New England had another gear that they could elevate. I I don't understand what I watch from the Titans week in, week out. They not only find ways to win, they find ways to cover. They have the best record in the National Football League right now from an ATS standpoint. And Payne, they haven't scored more than 20 points in each of their last three games. It's not like they're underdogs in all these games. They're winning games in as favorites and still finding ways to do it without getting north of 21 points most Sundays I'm watching it and I just don't have any idea what's going on and you can kind of just feel the vibe changing you're like oh shit here it comes here it comes right great you you think about (laughs) you think about Denver defensively right like where are they good the secondary is fantastic and I know Simmons ended up being announced out he was he was 50 50 but it's like the 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 play to Smith Aquina what happens there Uh, You know, just a defensive back slips on the turf. (laughs) Guys wide open, right? It's like not even normal stuff. It's like just a a cornerback in his normal back pedal. It wasn't like it was pouring rain and it was a slippery surface. Just slipped, just slipped. And like a fifth string wide receiver, you know, just streaking down the sideline. You got to heap praise on Noah Westbrook Akine. Not one, but two touchdown catches in the Titans 17-10 win. And thankfully for all of us and the rest of the football world, we get to see the Titans on a short week at Lambeau Thursday night against the Green Bay Packers. Uh, All right, you kind of transitioned us for us ugly-wise, and here's where I'm going to let you eviscerate me for my assessment. No, I don't do that. I just was a little shocked. I saw it here, and I said, boy, Todd woke up this morning and and chose violence, and Bill's (laughs) Mafia is going to be all in the mix. And they they may come after me. First things first. Give him credit for gutting out a performance when we didn't think he was going to play. You highlighted the back and forth, the information battle, trying to figure out how to 
quantify or identify an edge. But Josh Allen's completion percentage was better against Minnesota, but he's now thrown six interceptions over his last three games. And I know they're counting stats. They're not always indicative of exactly what we're seeing. Three touchdown passes during that stretch, three straight games with a passer rating under 80. And I question some of his decision-making in forcing these balls into tight windows. This is an electric offense. We know what they have as far as playmakers are concerned. It's been a lot more Stephon Diggs than I anticipated. When you look at the target share and everything else, I thought Dawson Knox and Gabe Davis were going to play bigger roles. You look at the running game, Devin Singletary is what he is at this point. Josh Allen is dynamic as a runner. I just haven't been blown away with Josh Allen's performances over the last couple of weeks. So I put it in the ugly. When you throw a costly interception, you fumble in the wake of your own end zone that even opened the door for the Vikings to get in there. It's not an indictment of Josh Allen. You throw him out with the Tuesday trash. It's just, hey, look, it's not the high level that we've grown accustomed to from an elite level quarterback. People are coming for you. I mean, right now, Josh (laughs) Allen is more important to Buffalo than hot wings. And you thought you would have never seen that. I mean, that guy is their golden child. He is untouchable. You cannot talk about him. Even if he has a poor performance, you cannot say a peep. Not allowed. (laughs) I'm, you know, the information that was received Monday internally was that they were were not optimistic and we obviously know it's a a ucl and he had suffered something similar a couple years back and missed four games and the initial vibe was we are waiting on more reports but we might be happy if it were only four weeks that was the initial like monday morning report that i had received that that source has been very good, and that source is 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 very close to Buffalo. Let's just put it that way. Very, very close. Um, and I was quite upset on Sunday. I almost turned into Ari Gold there. I was ready to uh, to deport that source naked to the Taliban uh, based upon Josh Allen playing there, okay? Uh, so not, not a happy camper. Let's just put it that way. Um, but Buffalo came out, and yes, they were a little bit sloppy. I think that's what it's been. But fourth best EPA per play of the week. I understand the Vikings defense a little bit vulnerable. Let's just put it that way. And you had to corner back out and, and Dantzler. So you know, there were some opportunities there, but yes, he's, he's making some mistakes. It's just tough for me in that spot. What was shocking to me is we just came out and we were chucking it all over the park. And Josh Allen is like Larry Zonka reincarnated running around out there over defenders through defenders like you'd never even know he had the injury it was the craziest thing so that game to me just continues to be wild Josh Allen's making some mistakes we're starting to see some things defenses are doing that Patrick Mahomes had to endure last season and you know they're going through their little the little rough patch here but I think they'll ultimately get it turned around yeah, I mean, look, I'm not saying that the Bills are going to miss the playoffs here. I'm just saying when you come well, in as go out on a limb. one of the MVP front runners and you struggle for a stretch, we're going to call you out. We don't issue hall passes around these parts. And so that was all I brought up with, with Josh. None Allen. of us, none of us in the know thought he was the MVP. No, that is uh, th- that the is the way he sure. was playing, even when everyone said he was the MVP. Right? We all know because it's Geno Smith. That's right. Well, at that point, like whether you looked at QBR or EPA or right, he was like Josh Allen was, he was a good, right? He was top five. He was like flirting in that like three, four category. And people are going to think, and listen, there's a long way to go. But based upon one team's offense being the best in football right now, and based upon that team not winning any games when he doesn't finish them. Yeah. He's the MVP. I, He's the MVP right now. Yep. And no one wants to hear this, and people are going to be like, oh, you're a Dolphins fan. Two is the MVP right now. And yep. again, it's not just because of the numbers, but he's supporting a defense that's like 25th in efficiency. And any game that he's finished, they've won. And any game that he didn't finish, they've lost. So it's it's right now, right? And a long way to go. We're, we're in week 10, but but he should be the, the MVP right now. I can't argue with you. Uh, given what we've seen from him, what he's doing from a historical context, and for... 
a guy that people said was overdrafted, was a bust, and a variety of other unpleasant things hurled in his direction. He has silenced his doubters and then some within the NFC East packing order. Last but not least, for me on the ugly side, um, the Bears, they build a 24-10 lead, have a chance to win. You talk about you know interesting line movement throughout the course of the week. This game got to three. There was a little bit of a battle. It closed three. It looked like the Bears were going to run away and hide. It's a costly pick six from fields that allows the Lions to get back in the game. The Bears miss an extra point. The Lions march down the field and then their defense rises up to the occasion for a 31-30 victory. It's not because it was a bad effort from the Bears. I mean, Fields is doing for fantasy owners, God, I mean something that we haven't seen over the last three to four weeks and going to win a couple of them fantasy championships as a result, but that's a game when you have a two-touchdown lead in the division, even with a young team and a lack of weapons, you have to go out there and close. So that's why the Bears make my ugly list when you have a 24-10 lead at home against the two-in Detroit Lions side yeah your hope is that you can close a game out like that and and that's part of the incremental phases of growth right lose games and then all of a sudden you can win a couple close ones and this is the one you're looking to get over the hump and obviously Dan Campbell to this point hadn't won a road game in his career got his first one so you're you're just hoping but I still think there's there's positive here and you know I got a little mud on my face early on in the season because I kind of went to bat for Justin Fields in our preseason previews and I said hey I think there's there's something here some of these underlying metrics to me indicate improvement to end last season and I think that he's got a chance if you put some guys around him if you're calling the right stuff and early on in the season it was ugly and the offense wasn't calling the right things and now they have confidence in Justin Fields they've put the game really in his hands and you have to like what you see here now are they going to win a bunch of games the rest of the season? I'm not sure because as much as the offense has improved, I think this ends up being the worst defense in the league based upon it being a below average defense to begin with and now just pieces are missing, right? You, you traded away some of your leaders, your captains, your best players on that side of the ball. So I'm not sure what that defense provides in terms of resistance for opponents, but this is a positive step in the right direction. Right, It looks like you have a couple of playmakers on offense. You're going to have some draft capital. You're going to have a ton of you know, uh, money and free agency. Hopefully, you build this the right way long term. Go get the guys that fit your system that you like. Don't overpay. Don't because you have a ton of money next year. You, you think you have to spend it all in, in one offseason. You don't like just build this thing the right way because there's potential here for some some long term positivity for Bears fans. Hey, this is something I never thought I would say after the first couple weeks of the season. The Bears are almost becoming must-see TV on Sundays because of what Fields is doing at the quarterback position. We saw the ridiculous run to get that game 10-10 at the half. You talked about a defense that can't stop anybody. And don't look now, but Justin Fields, sixth in the NFL in rushing yards, about a shade less than 200 behind Saquon Barkley. One hell of a story that would be if he was able to lead the league in rushing yards from the quarterback position. Uh, anything else ugly-wise you'd like to include before where we transition to a very brief look ahead line segment. I thought you were going to transition right there because Bears Falcons is one that we're discussing in the look ahead line segment. All right. See, that's why you're getting the hosting chops. I knew cardboard chat was going to pay dividends for you. Soon you're going to take my job. I'm going to get Mondays and Thursdays off. You're going to do this show entirely on your own, tossing from pain to pain. And we got a new show brewing there. Uh, you can follow Payne on Twitter at Payne Insider. I'm Todd Furman. You can follow me there. Most importantly, follow the podcast at Bet the Board Pod. And like we mentioned, a variety of other podcasts around the Bet the Board family. It's not just the NFL and college football, but if you're into sports cards and a little bit of sports memorabilia, I encourage you guys to check out Cardboard Chat Payne. Uh, And his co-host, Jesse Craig of PWCC Marketplace, do an outstanding job peeling back the curtain uh, of rapidly growing industry and is an outstanding alternative investment asset class, uh, given some of the distressed markets across the board elsewhere. So I want you guys to check that out. And also sign up for the Bet the Board weekly newsletter. It comes out on Friday. It's a recap of all the week's events that are going on, including some of the articles you may have missed, podcasts, and prop bets as well. That was a rocking chair winner for people that were subscribed this past weekend. Austin Eckler, under his rushing total, didn't even flirt with 30 in the game. Falcons and Bears, you mentioned it, the adjustment in the market. The Falcons were a four-point favorite. We see Atlanta lose on Thursday night to Carolina. The Bears come up short against the Lions, but the betting market responds onto a key number of three. This is 
I think you hit it perfectly, right? Mariota and the Falcons look lifeless on a short week in front of a national audience. And I understand there's some, right, you're, 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 you're still kind of in the mix in the NFC, even though it's kind of a delusional thought process. At what point do you go to a different quarterback? I don't know. But Mariota didn't look like that guy on Thursday night. The Bears, as we mentioned, are kind of becoming the lovable losers with Justin Fields putting up some gaudy Madden-like numbers. And you hinted at that, right? They're they're must-see TV right now. Chicago is the first team in NFL history to score 29 or more in three straight games while losing all three because the defense cannot stop a nosebleed. So I'm interested to see where this continues to transition and there's a couple spots Todd I would say this number is like 2.8 right now because a couple sharp shops are are below the key of three as we record you mentioned the Marcus Mariota thing and I don't want to go on a tangent here but I almost think the worst thing for the Falcons right now is that they're competitive in the division because if the Bucks ran away and hid from the NFC South I think it's a significantly easier transition for Arthur Smith to go hey look Marcus you kept the seat warm but it's time for us to figure out what we have with Desmond Ritter and how he can learn on the fly as a starting quarterback in the NFL. But alas, here's Atlanta fighting tooth and nail uh, with a chance to stay very relevant in the much maligned NFC. The Buffalo Bills pain were a six and a half point favorite. That number has now ballooned out to nine. Obviously a combination of factors as they'll play host to the Cleveland Browns this weekend. We know Josh Allen's healthy enough to play now. So that's a decent amount of this. There was obviously some skepticism built into the look ahead line. Browns coming off a curb stomping without an ability to stop a high-powered offense you get another one here in Buffalo we'll say this Stefanski had two weeks and didn't come up with the right offensive game plan against Miami he just wanted to be who he's he wanted to be right like his offense was his offense we're going to try to run and even though that's not the way you attack Miami's defense he chose to go that route but Buffalo hasn't been able to stop the run for three weeks now so you do have a a running dog situation here and now, actually, as we record, Dodd, we're out to 10 in this game. So <laughs> six and a half to 10 uh, on this one. It'll be interesting to see if that's if that's the price point that that gets a little interest in, in the Cleveland Browns. Uh, one other game I wanted to highlight, obviously, injury intrigue to two key contributors for one team's offense. That, of course, would be the Los Angeles Rams that are on the road against the New Orleans Saints. The Saints were a pick em. Uh, on the look ahead, they're now out to a full field goal favorite. It doesn't look good for Cooper Cup, and we await the updated status, which we'll get on Wednesday or Thursday most likely, for Matthew Stafford, who was unable to go this past Sunday against the Arizona Cardinals. Yeah, Cooper Cup is going to be sidelined for a few weeks, it looks like, with a high ankle sprain. The Rams haven't shown the ability to run the ball, which is what you can do to the Saints, as we talked about earlier. I do like the injection of Kyron Williams into the game late against Arizona. Let's see if you know he kind of gets the, the bulk of the work from the onset in this spot. One of the more interesting games from a market standpoint, I think it's going to create a stance from respected betters because the market does weird things, especially on the screen. And so I think we all know that Cooper Cup is out, but he's listed as questionable. And what happens when he gets announced out where is this going to go but you also have Matthew Stafford who I would think absolutely plays in this spot what happens when he gets announced in so there's going to be some some weirdness to the market here I think in this game well when you want to speculate on injuries again these are things oftentimes above your pay grade and mine that's why we bring in the good Dr. Deepak to break all of things down from a gambling and fantasy perspective are you injured or are you hurt <laughs> When injuries occur in the NFL, you need someone to call on. If you hurt, you can still play. If you're injured, you can't. Let's check in with Dr. Deepak Chona. Stanford and Harvard trained orthopedic sports surgeon and founder of Sports Med Analytics, the industry leader in data-driven injury analysis. So are you hurt or are you injured? All right. Well, thank you, Todd. Pumped to be bringing you your Bet the Board injury report. So let's dive right in. Starting with Cooper Cup. Now, the video was pretty concerning for a high ankle sprain. He, of course, could not put any weight on it right after. We're probably looking at a multi-week absence. These tend to be three to six weeks, depending on severity. MRI will likely come Monday, and then we'll know a little bit more. And then we have Leonard Fournette dealing with a hip pointer. These are painful injuries, but structurally stable. So with the bye coming week 11, Fournette has a good chance to rest up and play week 12. 
Then Josh Allen, thankfully no new injury to report. He did have excellent numbers in week 11, but I still wouldn't call him 100% for another one to two weeks. As long as he doesn't take a bad hit to the area that sort of torques his elbow, I would expect him to keep improving steadily. This whole issue should be behind him about four weeks from now. Then Jerry Judy. Now the video looked like a possible high ankle sprain. It was hard to tell, but MRI will help to show us the severity. Again, we're usually looking at three to six weeks, at the very least multi-week absence. Then Juju Smith-Schuster left the game with a concussion. He does have a chance to come back for week 11, but the most common outcome here, especially in the post-Tua era, is a one-week absence and then returned to the game. Now, wide receivers coming off a concussion do not really see any performance hit, so that's the good news for Smith-Schuster when he does come back. On Zach Ertz, now we can't say for sure from his video, but the mechanism was concerning for at worst case an ACL tear and at best case an MCL sprain. Now his face on the way to the locker room did not look promising. In the best case scenario, an MCL sprain would probably keep him out at least two weeks. In the worst case, of course, an ACL would be a season ender. So more to come on the story with Zach Ertz. And then we have Cole Komet. Now he's been looking really good, but he had an injury to his thigh. It looked like a contusion. Most of these wouldn't cause any missed games. So Komet will likely be returning to the practice field this week. Then we have Kyler Murray. Now he was ruled out as a game time decision this week with a hamstring, very likely to play next week. It's not surprising to see a losing team with a young franchise QB play it conservatively and not put him in harm's way but again Kyler Murray would likely be playing next week then we have Matt Stafford he is in concussion protocol didn't clear in time for week 10 but should by week 11 quarterbacks when they come off of concussions don't tend to see any sort of performance hit so looking for a full strength Matt Stafford next week and then we have Mark Andrews, of course, on the bye this week, but his week eight video suggested an AC joint sprain of his shoulder. The fact that it kept him from returning suggests at least moderate severity. Now he missed week nine. I would lean towards him returning now after his week 10 bye. On David and Joku, high ankle sprains for tight ends tend to average four to five weeks, and Joku's only at three, so he's most likely to return week 11 or 12. Performance dips for tight ends usually last six weeks though, so we wouldn't be looking to start him in his first week back regardless. And then Zeke Elliott. Zeke has now had three weeks to recover from an injury that tends to average three to four for running backs. He also tends to be aggressive in his return timelines, so we'd expect him to play week 11. However, it would be a little atypical to see him all the way full strength before week 12, so we'd anticipate some short-term workload limitations if active this coming week. And then Darren Waller, unfortunately not great news. Reaggravated hamstring strains average four to six weeks for tight ends and wide receivers. Players like Waller, who are in their 30s, tend to have high re-injury rates for the remainder of the year. He's not really a player I'm interested in targeting. Look at Keenan Allen's season as a cautionary tale for this case. Then Mike Williams. Williams has an outside shot to return week 11, but severe high ankles for wide receivers trend closer to five to six weeks. He's currently at only three. The more likely return date is week 12 or 13, but with a performance dip that usually would last through week 13. Then we have Keenan Allen. Now Allen re-aggravated his hamstring during the week eight bye. These tend to average four to six weeks, so it would be surprising to see him on the field before week 12 at earliest. These injuries for older players do tend to linger, so we'd be avoiding Keenan Allen for the rest of the season, pretty much in all formats regardless. And then DeAndre Swift. Now he looks like he's continuing to slowly ramp up. This usually takes a minimum of four games. He's at three. So I still feel good about starting Jamal Williams and avoiding DeAndre Swift for at least one more game. And then Chase Young. Now don't expect Young to rush his return. He's now one full year removed from ACL surgery, so he's very likely cleared for pretty much all activities, but he's on a losing team, and as a budding Young star, there's really minimal incentive for Young to ramp up too quickly. Expect his return to the field around week 12. 
and then Cardinal star Buddha Baker. Now Baker's dealing with a mild high ankle sprain. These still tend to take two to three weeks for DBs to return. He did return to the practice field this week briefly, so we're expecting his return to the field most likely week 11. And that's all for now. I'll turn it back to you, Todd. Holy hell, Payne. I had to sit there with a pen and paper and jot down all those injuries. It's basically a who's who of starting quarterbacks, skill position players, wide receivers. There appears to be nobody that was spared that can create big plays on the offensive side, at least through the first 10 weeks of the season. Feels like that's what's been going on. Yeah. I mean, why the season started with a bunch of unders felt like a ton of key cogs were out on the offensive side of the ball. And uh, we had a little bit more attrition this week with with some key cogs. Yeah, I mean, tight ends, running backs, wide receivers, you name it. Check those injury reports like always before you get your fantasy lineups ready to roll for the weekend. Uh, And of course, if you're looking to try and bet some of these games early before limits raise later in the week. All right, on to the final game of NFL Week 10. And that, of course, is a divisional matchup in Philadelphia where the Eagles will welcome in the Washington Commanders. You're looking at Philadelphia, an 11-point favorite pretty much across the board. There are some 10.5s out there. 43.5, the consensus on the total. One or two shops with a rogue 44. These two teams have played once already this season, a game Philadelphia dominated in D.C., winning to the tune of 24-8. The Eagles now have the sixth longest streak in league history, going eight games without trailing in the second half. When you look at Taylor Henneke, he's been good where it matters at the betting window. 8-2-1 and one against the spread in his last 11 starts. Meanwhile, the Commanders, they're not playing the most exciting brand of football right now. They've gone under the total in 6 out of 7. 35, excuse me, 34 points per game average between them and their opponents during this streak. And you look at Washington, Payne, we talked about it at the top of the show, how difficult it's been so far this season for double-digit favorites to cover numbers. If you blindly bet those double-digit dogs, you'd be profiting quite handsomely. Hell, you could bring that number all the way down to four and a half or better, and you'd be in a very difficult spot. When you assess this game and try and find a path for the commanders to be competitive, is it on the defensive side where they have to be good, or is it just taking the air out of the ball, letting Brian Robinson run his head into a brick wall 97 times? Antonio Gibson doing his thing on the outside, knowing that the Eagles have been a little bit light in the trenches and they can be beaten when you run between the tackles, especially with no Jordan Davis. Perfect. All of the above. You hit it. You hit the nail on the head there. Let's get out of Dodge. Now, um, listen, I think what I've seen in the market and it hasn't necessarily reflected it on screen. You did hint at some of the, the ten and a halfs appearing. Dog and under is what I have seen from a couple of groups, right? Came in under 44 and a half. That's why we're now down to 43 at, at Chris on the total. Some shops going to 10 and a half on the side here as um, things are kind of brewing in terms of health. And what you're looking at health wise is Jahan Dotson is going to be active for the commanders after missing the last five games with a hamstring injury. It looks like starting center Tyler Larson should play, even though he's been dealing with a back injury. And then randomly late in the week, Andrew Norwell popped onto the commander's injury report with a groin issue. Right now, it looks like both are going to play. So that is good news for the commanders getting a couple key cogs back. And I think to your point, the way that you would want to attack the Eagles in their current makeup is running the ball, shortening this game. If you look, the Steelers, when they played the Eagles, had 103 rushing yards on 13 carries after Jordan Davis left the game. Jordan Davis didn't play against the Texans, and you had this combination of Pierce and Burkhead that went for 148 on 28 carries. And that's an offense without its number one and number two receivers, right? Cooks and Collins were out that game, so you could load the box. And the Steelers and Texans are really bottom-of-the-barrel run offenses who showed some success. And I think that's ultimately the key for the commanders here because, again, without Jordan Davis in totality, the Eagles are 31st in success rate against running back carries, and they're allowing a league-high 30% of running back carries to result in a first down or a touchdown without the big fella on the field so Washington's got to find some success on the ground I know they're not the most efficient running team but again I mentioned right like the Steelers and Texans were both bottom of the barrel I think you need to see a little bit more Antonio Gibson he's far more burstier than than Brian Robinson I know the staff's just in love with Robinson but you got to find ways to get Antonio Gibson the ball a little bit more you need Taylor Heineke to show up here. I mean, it's a nice story. The guys seem to rally around him. 
but he's a backup quarterback. You know, he's just not performing overly well. He's QB 28 over the last three weeks in EPA per drop back. You did see this matchup earlier in the season. It was Carson Wentz under center. The first three quarters were just absolute domination. They, if you were watching that game, there was a, a graphic that got posted and, you know, Washington had like negative one yard and the Eagles had like over 300 yards. It was just a bloodbath in that game the first three quarters Carson Wentz negative 0.45 EPA per play and a 27 percent success rate Heineke has played this Eagles defense before he's seen this system I do think it's a little bit better especially in the secondary but Heineke played the Eagles in week 17 last year first three quarters he had a nice 60 percent success rate on dropbacks he was top 10 in EPA per play over that stretch as well so he's shown some success against this defense but to me like the biggest point of emphasis here Todd on this side of the ball it's all about Washington not getting too far away early on in this game so they can keep running and stretch that clock out and attack the Eagles weakness but you're seeing an Eagles offense and team in general that's just started really really fast and right now the Eagles have scored on 57 percent of their drives in the first half Washington just 19%. So that's where the large dichotomy comes in between these two teams because you have a fast-starting Eagles team. You have a really slow-starting Washington team. Scott Turner really hasn't devised the best game plans and scripts. And so that's huge here because if you can keep it within reach early, you can do everything you want to do in terms of game plan. But if the Eagles get out to a lead, all of a sudden you have to abandon that and it's Taylor Heineke chucking from behind. It's not a good equation. When you look at the Eagles, I mean, this is a team that's poised to be favored by double digits in three straight games for the first time since the 1970 merger. You, to your point, talking about fast starts, plus 96, their point differential in the second quarter this season, outscoring their opponents 133-37. to 37. It's the best point differential by any team in any quarter through eight games since 2000. The first team with a positive turnover differential in each of its first eight games since the 1972 Steelers. Team hasn't led the league in takeaways and giveaways like the Eagles are on track to do since the 49ers accomplished that feat back in 2011. Payne, when you look at this Eagles offense and you try and figure out what's making them so successful, obviously the low-hanging fruit is Jalen Hurts making better decisions. The addition of A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith has kind of almost become an afterthought as far as his stats and overall production as it's the Dallas Goddard and Brown show. But what else have you seen from Philadelphia that should allow them to have success against a Washington defense that, to their credit, has been better over the last couple weeks, especially stopping the run, even if they don't add Chase Young into the fold, who it looks like it's going to take him another week to join that defensive unit? Yep, Chase Young will be out again this evening. The one thing that you mentioned there, and again, why I think the dogs attracted some, some sharp money here, is that on paper, on the surface, right, Philadelphia wants to be this run first offense and Washington's run D has been their strength especially the way they're trending and we saw that unfold in front of our eyes against Minnesota two weeks ago but where the commanders have been really susceptible is through the air and that's really where Jalen Hurts has made these strides because it's been A.J. Brown it's been Devontae Smith it's been you know a lot less of Jalen's legs compared to early on in the season they're trusting him to throw the ball more and he's been proficient doing it he's been accurate he's getting the ball out on time he knows where to go with it but if you look at the commanders right they have not played a very good schedule of passing offenses and yet they're 25th in defensive pass efficiency if you go through this list of quarterbacks and I know some of them are playing above expectation but just in general here's the list of quarterbacks Washington's played it's Trevor Lawrence it's Goff it's Cooper Rush it's Tannehill it's Fields it's you know the current version of of Rodgers and the Packers offense just kind of strike what you saw yesterday from your mind and you'll understand what that means it's you know sam sam ellinger right it's it's cousins and then it was this eagles offense and jalen hurts back in week three and that was really you know the the top tier offense they'd played through the year uh through the season so far so it's not been this gauntlet of like great passing attacks and that's where i think the eagles could have some success tonight because they can build the lead through the air then kind of takes away what Washington wants to do offensively. And and when you kind of break this down a little bit further and you look at some of the the coverages that Washington uses, I would think 
that lends itself to A.J. Brown seeing a really, really large target share tonight. If you look, he just gets the lion's share of targets based upon when the Eagles play defenses that use man coverage and the commander's defense use man coverage at a top 10 rate. So I would think A.J. Brown's going to be the focal point of this offense. I think Devontae Smith has, has showed pretty well this season. Obviously, he's he's an afterthought compared to A.J. Brown, but those two do provide a nice little tandem here that I think could give the commanders trouble on defense. And, and that, to me, is the entire key, right? Game state is massive here. The commanders cannot fall asleep at the wheel to start this game they have to come out with a little bit more energy a little bit more passion a little bit better of a game plan and script and that's ultimately what i think pro betters are banking on here have you seen enough from the eagles passing attack that if a team sells out to stop the run that they can do enough to just win a game through the air with jalen hurts ongoing maturation depends who you play i mean i think there are certainly holes I mean, I, it's great that the Eagles have started 8-0, eight, eight and, and I know Philly fans are loving that, and all signs point to them being really involved in this playoff run because that's a very difficult place to play. And it just depends what opposing defenses elect to do. I mean, Jalen Hurts has proven the last handful of weeks that if you're going to sell out and stop the run, I'm going to be able to throw the ball, and that's really what that addition of A.J. Brown has meant to this offense. And when you now have a couple key cocks, I mean, Dallas Goddard's been cooking as well lately. Your you guy. have these, yeah, that is my guy. You have a couple of competent pass catchers that are matchup nightmares, and it really doesn't lend itself to selling out to stop the run. And that's really been what that addition of A.J. Brown means. Obviously, right, for fantasy perspective, for guys like, watching the game right ball watchers like oh aj brown's pretty good but even when aj brown's not involved in the play catching the ball what he means for what defenses have to do to the eagles i mean it just opens things up for that entire offense Yep, it should be a, an interesting game only because it's a division rivalry. Obviously tough to try and navigate through some of these double-digit spreads when you need certain things to go the right way for you. But as we talked about, double-digit dogs have definitely had their day so far this season. Anything else that you've seen on this game of note uh, as far as side or total? It looks like, I mean, 43.5 kind of out there appears to have seen a little bit of under money initially. You would think, at least on the surface, that's correlated to the dog and the two kind of work hand-in-hand hand with one another. Yeah, that's the only thing I've heard. I have not bet either yet, but the, the two components that I heard earlier in the week was, you know, I got sent under at 44 and a half from, you know, really respected better. And I've I've seen some some commanders plus 11 in the accounts have not bet either personally at this point. Makes sense. I mean, you feel like that is kind of the approach that's there. If it's enough to get you to the window, that remains to be seen. That is, of course, why they play the games and tonight will kick off at 8.15 Eastern. Other news nugget pain, because I know you were sitting on pins and needles waiting for this to become a truly official, the Carolina Panthers going back to Baker Mayfield in the wake of P.J. Walker's high ankle sprain. So you've seen a little bit of money come in on Carolina on a Monday morning for their game next Sunday against the Baltimore Ravens. You can follow Payne on Twitter at Payne Inside. I'm Todd Furman. You can follow me there. Most importantly, as always, follow the podcast at Bet the Board Pod. Payne, anything else you'd like to share with our listeners this fine Monday before uh, we close up shop for the day? That's everything. All righty. On that note, want to wish all of you, our loyal listeners, the best of luck with all of your investments, wherever they should take you tonight between the Eagles and Commanders. Thanks, as always, for tuning in for all of our Bet the Board shows. We'll be back with you on Wednesday to break down a busy week on the college football slate. And, of course, right here on Thursday to talk all things NFL Week 11. Best of luck with all of your bets tonight, and hopefully we'll see you at the window. Thanks for listening to Bet the Board. You can catch Todd and Payne every Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday during football season, breaking down the biggest NFL and college football games. And to make sure you don't miss any free best bets, subscribe to Bet the Board on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts.